Hi, Dr. Pulsifer here to talk about something that I think is very important, important enough that this will be a two-part lecture, if you will. Are you designing a game or are you throwing one together? Yes, creativity is part of game design, but it only amounts to about 10% of the whole. The rest is more or less engineering. You identify problems, propose solutions, implement the solutions, test the results of those solutions, and so on. Scientific method is involved in your testing, and engineering is involved in your solutions, and occasionally inspiration and creativity. What it definitely is not, or should not be, is trial and error. And I'm using the meaning that was prevalent when I was young, uh, that of guessing what might work and then checking to see if it does. It's guessing there seems to be a notion nowadays that trial and error is more or less scientific method, but no, that's not what I'm talking about. Game design is not a guessing game. Let me use an example from a beginning programming class to illustrate. While I was a college teacher, I substituted for a teacher who was ill in a programming class for beginners. Many of the people were not going to be programmers, but everybody was required to learn some programming, which made good sense in a computer department. The students had a program to work on, simple one, so I walked around trying to help. In general, their program didn't work. This is not surprising. Programming is very logical. The proper response when the program isn't working is to figure out the program flow, identify where it went wrong, change the program, and test the solution. It works the same way in game design once you're playing a prototype. That identify might include some intuition, and the solution might involve some creativity, but mostly it's logic. But what did these students do? Rather than try to figure out why it wasn't working, they just guessed. Then they changed the program in accordance with their guess, and they compiled it again to see what happened. If that didn't work, they guessed something else. They were using traditional trial and error, guess and check. And they were frustrated, of course, because it wasn't working. So I tried to show them how to figure out the logic and flow of the program rather than just guess. Now, game design, I would say, ought to be the same way. Some people won't do it that way, but I think it's the most efficient way, and it's the way that I like to teach people. Certainly, different people have different design methods. Some design more from the gut than from logic uh, with hypotheses and tests. But if you are actually designing something, you are primarily using your brain in an organized way, I hope, and not just relying on inspiration. Inspiration is not very reliable. It comes and goes. You can't do things in an organized manner continuously as a professional just relying on inspiration. The more you treat the modifications as an engineering problem, the more efficient you're going to be. Now, some people may think of a game as art rather than craft, and the more that you think of it as art, the more you might be inclined to rely on inspiration and intuition. So we might say that you're not designing a game, you're creating a game. Practically speaking, though, it's mostly craft once you have a playable prototype. And that playable prototype is going to change a lot if you're doing a good job. So game design is not throwing things against the wall to see if they stick. That's what trial and error amounts to. Let's try this and see what happens. Let's try that and see what happens. Well, some things might happen better than others, but it's a terrible way to solve a problem if you have any alternative. And I've seen this dramatically illustrated. A beginning designer had his simple multiplayer, less than 30 minute game, which would involve cards and scoring only. And he had it play tested by players new to the game. The game had already been successfully kickstarted, but clearly it was far from done. Most of the cards were handwritten, not even computer generated, for example. As he started the game, and to me he made the error of also playing the game, I saw that he had no rules with him. 
His response was he played it six or seven different ways and was changing it to satisfy backers as well, so he didn't bring the rules. So here we have a game that's already kickstarted, and the rules writing wasn't being tested since the rules weren't even at hand. But then he said he was trying to out a particular rule change. Well, my reaction was, how can you try a change when the rest of the game isn't stable? You're only trying the change with one of those half dozen ways to play. When you play test, you play test the whole game, not just the part that you're experimenting with. The next question was, how are you recording the results of the play test? He said he usually had a notebook, but not today. But he did have a laptop, and he took notes after the game ended or after he was eliminated. I don't know which. And I can point out here that it was a game with player elimination, which is not desirable nowadays, even in a 30-minute game. And though it was a scoring game, he hadn't bothered to bring the scoring devices, so everyone scored on their smartphones. This is just sloppy. You've got to test the actual game, not substitutes. So, I've talked about some of the obvious flaws like player elimination, but there was another one. It was a card game of direct attack on other players. There was no constraint on whom you could attack. They had about five or six players in this game. So while I didn't watch the game much, I was doing other things, I asked afterward if there was a strong tendency to attack the leader. And the answer from the players was yes, just as I expected. The game suffered from leader bashing. I'm not sure the designer actually recognized the term when I used it, and he only had a glimmering of why it was undesirable. People started to suggest solutions, but the first, only allowing attack on adjacent players, would have pre pretty drastically changed the game that's already kickstarted. As an aside, why is leader bashing undesirable? It takes most of the decision making out of the game. You just attack the leader. It makes people want to sandbag. They don't want to be the leader. And it's dull because it's predictable. And I'll talk more about this in part two.